Welcome to the Let's Say Toolkit for Home-Based Child Care Webinar Series, hosted by Child Care Aware of America, the National Association of Family Child Care, the Children's Environmental Health Network, Eco Healthy Child Care, and the National Center for Healthy Housing. I'm Kiami Harris from Child Care Aware of America, and we're really excited to be partnering with these organizations to share information with you today about lead and drinking water and how you can take action to reduce the potential for exposure in your home-based child care facility. And thank you for joining us. We recognize that free time is hard to come by and that these are really challenging times to pay attention to anything other than keeping your family, children, staff safe from COVID-19 or helping your business survive this global crisis. Regardless of whether you are joining us live this evening, watching the recording during that time, or finding another opportunity to learn more about the dangers of lead, we appreciate your commitment to protecting children from lead exposure. This session is being recorded, and unfortunately, due to the time constraints, we're not going to be taking questions today. During today's webinar, the second in a four-part series, We'll hear a little bit about the Lead Safe Toolkit for Home-Based Child Care, learn about the dangers of lead, review a sample policy that you can put in place to help reduce exposure to lead and drinking water in your home-based child care facility, and share some tips on effectively implementing that policy. If you listen to the first webinar in the series, the next few slides will be a repeat of that information. But hang in there for a few minutes while we reinforce this important context, and then we'll jump right into today's focus on drinking on lead and drinking water. Today we will be learning about steps you can take to reduce exposure to lead in drinking water. But there are other ways that you and the children and staff in your facility can be exposed to lead. The other webinars in this series will help you address how to reduce exposure to lead in paint soil, and in consumer products like toys. All the webinars will be recorded and available online, and we want to encourage you to watch all four in the series. The first webinar about lead and paint is already posted there for you to view. For those of you watching live, our colleagues at the National Association for Family Child Care are pleased to be able to offer training certificates for today's webinar. Proof of attendance will be sent via email within a week of the live webinar. Please check your junk or spam email folder as it often gets automatically sorted there. If you haven't received your certificate in one week, please email NAFCC at the email address shown at the end of today's webinar. To help us get started, let me introduce Hester Paul from the Children's Environmental Health Network who will tell you all about the toolkit. Hester? Thank you, Kiami. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks for joining everyone. This webinar series is based on a toolkit that was designed to provide home-based or family child care providers like you with resources and strategies to ensure the safety of your child care facilities. It is available online at the link on your screen. Like the webinar series, the toolkit itself is divided into four main categories, how to avoid lead exposure from paint, drinking water, soil, and consumer products, plus a general resources section. Each of the four categories contains a sample policy that you can adopt for your business and share with the families you serve. We know that there is so much to keep up with on a daily basis when running a home-based childcare facility, in an effort to support you guys, we have created four lead-focused policies, which detail best practice commitments that can be added to your parent handbook. Creating or adopting a policy ensures that a practice continues over time, regardless of whether or not you hire new additional staff. All staff should be on the same page about how to prevent lead exposures. Additionally, the families you serve may be interested in knowing how you worked to prevent lead exposure within your home. You are welcome and strongly encouraged to share these policies with the parents you serve so that they too can make similar changes within their own homes. Along with each policy is a worksheet to help you set the policy into action one step at a time. 
Each worksheet gives you val valuable information about the importance of ensuring that homes are lead safe and gives approximate costs for the recommended steps to reduce lead exposure. These worksheets complement the policies. So each of the four categories, again, avoiding lead exposure from paint, drinking water, soil, and consumer products have both a unique policy and a worksheet. The worksheets are longer documents, they're more comprehensive, and they offer detailed information as to how to go about making changes within your home so as to feel confident that you can uphold the policy. Links to resources and contacts you can consult as you implement the policy are also provided. As we've mentioned, today we'll be focusing on steps you can take to reduce exposure from lead in drinking water. We're going to cover a lot of information and we've heard from childcare providers like you that it can be a little scary and overwhelming. So if you only take away one thing from this webinar, we hope it's that um, help is available to you and that you can do this. We know you care and that's the reason you're listening right now. And we've created this toolkit to make it a little bit easier for you to take action. You might not be able to do all of the things that are recommended right away, but that's also why we broke up the toolkit into different areas so that you can find the starting point that feels right to you and your childcare home. And now to help us let us dive into this topic, let me welcome Latricia Adams. Latricia Adams is a proud native of Memphis, Tennessee, and is the founder, CEO, and president of Black Millennials for Flint. President of Black Millennials for Flint is a grass, excuse me, Black Millennials for Flint is a grassroots environmental justice and civil rights organization with the purpose of bringing like-minded organizations together to collectively take action and advocate against the crisis of lead exposure, specifically in African-American and Latino communities throughout the nation. Latricia founded the first lead prevention commission in the state of Tennessee's history in 2019 and has a multitude of other accomplishments, but we don't have time to dive into that today. So let me please welcome Latricia. Good evening and thank you, Hester, um, so much um, for that warm introduction and thank you all for everyone taking the time this evening um, to learn about lead and drinking water. I just wanted to um, introduce myself a little bit further um, just to kind of connect you to why this is such an important topic. Um, so um, with Black Millennials for Flint, um, we were actually founded in 2016. Um, it started as an outreach community-based um, work um, in response to the Flint water crisis, but we very much so know that lead is not only in water, but it um, manifests and comes in many different forms. Um, we were founded um, by three amazing Black women, all historically Black um, college graduates, um, which is really important thinking about the, the climate in our country, about how valuable um, Black people are to um, the development of this country. So I'm really excited today to be able to um, build coalitions and collaborations with people who are really invested in providing the safest environments for our most vulnerable little people, which are our children. So beginning on with the presentation, starting to talk about lead and water. Lead can be found in all parts of our environment, the air, the soil, the water, and even inside our homes. Much of our exposure comes from human activities, including the use of fossil fuels, the past use of leaded gasoline, some types of industrial facilities, past use of lead-based paint in homes, and past use of lead in the service lines that's delivered drinking water to our homes. Lead has been used in a variety of products found in and around our homes. In addition to paint, this includes ceramics, pipes and plumbing, materials, solder, gasoline, batteries, ammunition, cosmetics, children's toys, and even more. But let's take a step back for a minute and remind ourselves why it matters if children are exposed to lead and why your role as a child care provider is so important. Lead is particularly dangerous to children because their growing bodies absorb more lead than adults do and their brains and nervous systems are more sensitive to the damaging effects of lead. 
It doesn't take very much lead to create harm. And our last webinar about lead and dust, we talked about how the amount of lead contaminated dust that fits in a sugar packet would be enough to contaminate a whole football field. Since tonight's focus is water, let's consider a different analogy. The EPA's action level for lead in water is 15 parts per billion. That's equivalent to 15 drops of water in a swimming pool. Lead in water is invisible and tasteless. That's why it is important to know how to identify if you have a lead hazard in your home and what you can do to remove it. And we created this toolkit to help you do just that. So what happens when children are exposed? Very high doses of lead, which are rarely seen in the US today, can cause seizures, coma, and death. However, even much lower levels between three and five micrograms per deciliter in a child's blood can lead to neurological damage, including impaired memory and executive function, which is the ability to plan, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks. Such blood lead levels can lead to decreased IQ and academic performance and can also cause behavioral problems such as impulsivity, hyperactivity, and attention disorders. Some studies suggest that lead exposure may also cause antisocial behaviors or conduct disorders, depression, anxiety, and withdrawn behavior that's the tendency to avoid the unfamiliar either people, places, or situations. And it is important to note that even though lead is harmful in all of these different ways, children who are exposed to these lower levels of lead won't appear sick. The only way to tell if a child has been exposed to lead is to have a blood lead test. The next obvious question is if it's so dangerous, how do we get exposed to lead and why are children at such great risk? In addition to being more sensitive to lead's harmful effects, babies and young children can also be more highly exposed to lead because they often put their hands and other objects that have lead from dust or soil on them into their mouths. Infants drinking formula are also in danger if the formula is made with lead contaminated water. People may also be exposed to lead by eating and drinking food or water containing lead from dishes or glasses that contain lead, inhaling lead dust from lead paint, lead based, lead based paint or lead contaminated soil, or again, from playing with toys, which can also contain lead paint. A lot of exposure happens in and around home environments. We know from the National Human Activity Pattern Survey that Americans spend 70% of their time on average in home environments. That number is even higher for certain populations, including the kids who spend time in your home-based childcare facilities. Think about the number of hours those kids spend playing in your home and it becomes clear why it is so important to make that environment as safe as possible. Since the focus of tonight's webinar is on lead and drinking water, let's take a minute to learn a little bit about how lead gets into our water. Lead can enter drinking water when pipes and plumbing fixtures that contain lead corrode, especially where the water was high in acidity or had low mineral content. There are three main sources of lead. The first is lead pipes. Lead can be present in service lines, which are the pipes that connect the water main under the street to a building's plumbing. Congress banned the use of lead pipes in 1986. Lead can also be present in the solder that is used to connect copper pipe and fittings. Congress also banned the use of leaded solder in 1986. And finally, leaded alloys. Brass is frequently used in faucets and other plumbing components. Congress also limited the amount of lead brass in 1996 and then reduced the level again recently as of 2014. What's important to know is that some parts of the plumbing system are inside your house and that's what you probably think about 
when you talk about your plumbing. But there are also parts of the system outside your house. These parts are underground, so we don't think about them as often, but some of them are on your property and part of them are public property. This matters because lead can be present in any part of the system and you may share responsibility with your water utility for the service line. In other words, if there is lead in your service line, your water utility may be responsible for replacing part of it and you actually may be responsible for replacing another part of it. In some communities, water utilities are able to help homeowners with the cost of replacing the part of the service line that is on private property, but we'll talk about that a little later. Now, you may also be wondering why there is lead in our service lines at all and how it gets out of the service line and into the water. Historically, lead was used because it is both durable and more flexible than some other materials. Sometimes there is a chemical reaction between the water in your plumbing or the service line that can cause the lead to dissolve or wear away. This is called corrosion. There are a number of factors that influence how much lead gets into your water. These include the chemistry of the water and the types and amounts of minerals in the water, the amount of lead the, the water comes into contact with, the temperature of the water, the amount of wear in the pipes, how long the water stays in pipes, and the presence of protective scales or coatings inside the plumbing materials. Controlling corrosion is a priority for your water utility, but it cannot completely eliminate leaching of lead. Any home, including those with lead-free brass fixtures and solder, may observe lead in their drinking water, but the following types of homes are more likely to have higher levels. Older homes are more likely to have lead service lines and interior plumbing containing lead. Homes with soft water, which has fewer dissolved minerals and water that is more acidic and higher in dissolved oxygen can be more corrosive. Check with your local water utility to find out more about whether your water is corrosive and what can be done. Signs of corrosive water include frequent leaks, discolored water and tainted or stained dishes or clothes. And remember, you cannot see nor taste lead in water. Lead release can occur when other signs of corrosion are not present. Now, the good news is that lead exposure is preventable. We know how to find sources of lead in your home and how to fix them. You can start taking steps today by having an impact immediately. And again, that's why we created the toolkit to help childcare providers like you get started. As Hester already mentioned, the toolkit has a sample policy you can adopt to help protect your to protect those in your care from lead exposure and drinking water sources and to help you communicate with parents and staff about lead and drinking water and the preventative steps you're taking to address it. There are three major components to the lead and drinking water policy included in the toolkit. They are listed on your screen now, and they ask you to commit to the following. Learning about the source of water coming into your home, testing your water for lead, and most important, determining whether your home has a lead surface line or lead containing pipes, fixtures, or solder. In addition to the general policy statement on lead and drinking water, the toolkit has a worksheet that contains six simple steps, each with step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement the lead and drinking water policy, which we'll go over in just a moment. We suggest that you review and fill out the worksheet once a year and keep it in your family handbook so that you, your staff, and your clients can always have the most up-to-date information available. The first step outlined in the worksheet, step one, is to learn more about where your water comes from. 
If your water comes from a community water system, you can call to request a copy of its annual water quality report called a Consumer Confidence Report, or for short, CCR. Keep the CCR on file along with the name and contact information for the community water system and update this information annually. If you know your water comes from a private well or another private water supply source, skip to step two. Whether your water is supplied by a water utility or comes from a private water supply, your next step is to try to determine if lead service lines supply your water. How you do this depends on the type of water system you have. If your water comes from a community water system, call the water utility to see if they have records on lead service lines in your area. If records are unavailable, the water utility may also be able to inspect your home. If the utility can't help or if your water comes from a private water supply, you can hire a licensed plumber to investigate for lead service lines. Once you have additional information on whether or not there is a lead service line connected to your home, share this information with the parents and staff. If you do not have lead service lines connecting to the building um, from the water main under your street, the rest of the policy worksheet will help guide you in the steps to take next. Once you know about the service lines connecting to your house to the water main, you will also want to know about the plumbing and fixtures inside your house. You can use the age of your home to help with step three, which is to try to determine if your home has lead containing pipes, fixtures, or solder. A licensed plumber can also help to determine whether the pipes and fixtures may contain lead. Again, Homes built before 1986 are more likely than newer homes to contain these features, but some newer homes may have brass or other fixtures that contain lead. You can't tell by looking at these fixtures if they have lead in them, so you should test your water. Step four provides guidance on how to have your water tested for lead. You can call EPA's Safe Drinking Water Hotline and the number is presented on the screen at 1-800-426-4791 to find local contact information for testing your water for lead. Testing usually costs between $20 and $100 per sample. Contact your water utility staff if your water comes from a community water system. They may be able to test the water for lead themselves or refer you to an EPA accredited lab in your state. If your water comes from a household well or other private water supply, you can contact your state or local drinking water authority for a list of EPA accredited laboratories that can help with testing. For more information, see EPA's three T's, and that's training, testing, and taking action for reducing lead in drinking water toolkit. The link to this toolkit is on the screen now and is also in the resources section of the toolkit. Once you have your water tested, keep records of all test results. If testing finds that you have lead concentrations above five, above five parts per billion in your drinking water, step five provides guidance on how to take short-term measures to reduce exposure. We're gonna walk through these short-term measures, but the EPA resource shown on the screen and in the general resources section of the toolkit can provide additional details. So testing found lead in your water. You'll want to take some time some of the following, with some of the following measures to reduce exposure. Some of these are free and some cost money, and we'll do our best to give you an idea of the options. First, remember that the temperature of the water was one of the factors that influences how much lead gets into the water. Because of this, you should only use cold water for drinking and cooking, especially when preparing baby formula. This is a no cost best practice. Note that this will help, but if lead levels are above five parts per billion in your water, this practice alone will not be sufficient to protect the children in your care. You can also flush taps before drinking. That is, if you let the water run for three to five minutes before using any of it, 
Because you pay for this water you use, this isn't free, but it is still a low cost best practice. Some childcare homes may decide to use a water cooler dispenser to provide drinking water or water used for formula or cooking. Water jugs will need to be replaced regularly and cost between six to $10 each. So this is a moderate cost best practice. Another option is to install water filters at the taps to remove, help remove lead. Nationally certified water filters are effective at removing lead if they are used and maintained correctly, and this includes periodic replacement. They come in different forms and can be attached directly to a faucet or installed under a sink and typically cost between $65 up to $500. EPA has a tool for identifying point of use drinking water filters certified to reduce lead. There's a link on the screen and in the toolkit. These certification marks indicate that a filter meets the NSF ANSI standard 53 for lead removal. For additional protection, look for a filter that is also certified against standard 42 for particulate reduction. You should also check the filter packaging for text, which indicates whether the filter has been certified to reduce lead. These details are spelled out in the worksheet, so don't worry about remembering or trying to write them all down right now. Finally, you can also consider using single serve bottled water for cooking and drinking needs, as this is the most expensive, wasteful, and environmentally taxing best practice, it should only be used as a last resort. The next step, step six, is to put longer term solutions in place. Replacing fixtures, pipes, and service lines is the most effective way to eliminate lead in water, but it can be expensive. If your water is supplied by a community water system, contact your local water utility for more information on replacing lead service lines. Some water utilities offer customer assistance programs to help offset the cost of replacement. If your water comes from a private water supply, you'll need to hire a licensed contractor to replace the lead service line or other pipes and fixtures that may contain lead. EPA has some useful resources to help with this part of the process as well, including a guide on selecting lead-free plumbing and fixtures if the pipes or fixtures inside your home need to be replaced. There are different measures you can take to reduce or eliminate lead in drinking water in your home. You'll need to know where the lead is coming from to know which of these measures you need to put in place. For example, is it coming from fixtures, the pipes, the service line, or could it potentially be all three? If the fixtures inside your home have lead or might contain lead, you should consider replacing them. And at an approximate cost of $200 per faucet, this is a moderate cost best practice. You may also need to consider replacing the plumbing pipes inside your home if they contain lead. With a minimum of $1,500, this is a more expensive best practice. Finally, if the service line connecting your house to the water main contains lead, it will also need to be replaced to eliminate or reduce lead exposure. With an approximate cost of $2,000, this is also an expensive best practice. However, as noted earlier, some water utilities offer customer assistance programs to help offset the cost of replacement, and it is worth asking what assistance may be available. Whatever steps you take to reduce exposure, you should always keep records of your remediation efforts and keep track of any schedules for upkeep or maintenance that may need, be needed in the future. We know we've covered a lot of ground tonight, but thankfully all of the information we shared is included in the toolkit that you can download for free. The toolkit also contains links to several resources mentioned throughout tonight's webinar, 
where you can get more information about how to safely identify and address lead drinking water hazards as you walk through the six simple steps we've outlined tonight. As I close my remarks tonight, I want, to I want you to remember that lead poisoning is preventable. There are solutions. We know how hard it is to find hazards, but we also know how to fix them and help is available. Thank you all so much. And all of these resources will be avail available to you. Turning it back over to Hester. This is Tiami. Thank you, Latricia. And of course, if you have questions, you're welcome to contact the folks at Children's Environmental Health Network or the National Center for Healthy Housing. And we will do our best to get you the answers you need to take the first steps for reducing lead exposure in your home-based child care facility. If you um, have questions, again, you can contact the individuals there. There are emails right at the top of your screen. We'll also remind you that training certificates are available. Proof of attendance will be sent via email within a week of the live webinar. Please check your junk and spam email folder as it often gets lost and get sorted right there. If you haven't received your certificate within one week, please email Nicole at NAFCC at conference at NAFCC.org. If your state's agency accepts training, you can submit your training certificate to your state's professional development registry. If you are working towards NAFCC accreditation, you may include this training along with your NAFCC accreditation application or NAFCC update. Please contact NAFCC for more information about training our requirements. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We hope that you will join us for the next webinar in the series on Wednesday, July 22nd, which will focus on lead in soil. Today's webinar and all the webinars in the series will be available to watch as recordings at the link on the next screen. Have a great evening.